Okay, this is our first lecture, and I've chosen to use Paul Hewitt's uh, lecture slides. I really think he's done a good job. He draws a lot of pictures. Um, I like it a lot. So we'll, uh, we'll use this in our class, uh, along with all of the material from your book. The first guy we need to talk about is Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great, so he was one of the great Greek philosophers of antiquity, and he was so influential on hundreds and hundreds of years of people after him because the books that he wrote were considered to be authoritative. Everybody would say, you know, Aristotle is so smart he couldn't make a mistake. He made so many mistakes. Uh, he was really smart, but he didn't really go about science the way scientists go about science. He didn't do an, conduct an experiment and then uh, look to be what happened, make measurements, and then do it again and again until you come with some idea of what's going on. He simply thought about it. And so to him, things that were very logical, very, uh, very obvious, um, he simply said these things are true and they were accepted for ages. So when he wrote on uh, motion, he had this concept that everything had a proper motion. So for instance, if you had um, fire, fire would always um, go up, okay? It was just the way fire did. Rocks would always fall down. That's just what rocks did. So there was a motion inherent in the substance, and according to the Greeks, there were four substances, earth, water, air, and fire. And then your job um, as an observer of nature was simply to, to look and say, what kind of substance is this? Uh, if it's fire, it must go up. If it's rocks, it must go down. And so if you had something like a, a bird that would go up, a bird must have fire somehow in it. Okay, if you had uh, rain that went down, then there must be some earth in there, and that's how they determine things. Of course, that wasn't scientifically studied, and that's why it's all a bit big um, mishmash. So they had two types of motion. You had violent motion where something makes something else happen. So the wind pushes a boat, or, uh, or the wind, um, you know, or the, or the rain, comes down on you and, and gets you wet or something like that. So you had violent motion where one thing made something else happen and then you had natural motion. And this is where rocks always fall down or um, fire always goes up. Okay, so that, that's its nature. That's how it, it moves by its nature. Anything outside of the earth was considered the heavens and the heavens worked mathematically. Everything was perfect mathematical combinations and so circles, circles, circles. According to the Greeks, everything in the heavens moved in orbs or globes or circular motion. So about 1400 years later, okay, so you had now Aristotle in the 1500s in Italy he was just daring enough to say Aristotle might be wrong. And people were like, how is that possible? How could Aristotle be wrong? He's smart, we learn about him. Um, and he said, well, he's not dumb. Maybe he's wrong. You can be wrong without being dumb. And so he, tried, he read in Aristotle's book that a big object would hit the ground faster than a small object if you threw it from the same distance, okay? So Galileo just said, okay. And he went up to the top of a tower, the Pisa Tower, that's still leaning now. It hasn't actually fallen over yet. And it was leaning in the 1500s. And he threw a big cannonball and a small cannonball, uh, launched at the same time. And to everyone's amazement, it hit the ground at the same time. Okay, so you're, you now have this idea that experimentation is the way you figure out about truth not just uh, conceptualization or philosophy. Uh, that's not the only way of finding out truth. So he discovered that these different weights would hit the ground at the same time, and so a moving object doesn't need a force uh, to keep it moving if there were no friction. So for instance, you could roll a ball across the floor and eventually it's gonna stop there must be a force opposing it. That was his idea. 
if there was no force at all opposing it, it would keep going forever. So that is the conception that all of us hold now. It, it makes perfect sense and it, it's tested a thousand million thousand ways. So for instance, if you were in space where there's no air and you threw a hammer, you could throw it, I don't know how fast you could throw a hammer, but you, whatever, whatever speed it leaves your hand, it'll never slow down. And it'll always go in a straight line forever until it comes into some kind of a gravity field from a star or a planet or something. So, so if there's no opposition, it keeps moving. The only reason something slows down is that there is another force acting in reverse. So we define a force as a push or a pull. So if you drop something, there must be a force pulling it. Uh, we are going to call that gravity. If it slows down, there must be a force slowing it down. Often that's friction. So we'll look at all of these mo motions of objects as an interplay between uh, between the, the idea of pulling something and then keeping it from moving. So an opposition to a force. The other thing that's interesting is inertia. Now the reason why Aristotle and everybody else thinks that a big object is going to uh, fall faster is because if you have any idea of gravity, gravity pulls on a mass. And the bigger the mass, the more pull that it will exert. The reason why that the two objects uh, fall at the same rate and actually hit the ground at the same time. Now the two cannonballs were pretty cool because if I would have dropped a feather and a cannonball, the feather would stay in the air because it's catching the wind as it falls. Uh, the cannonballs are both the same shape and it goes th cuts through the wind pretty much equally. Uh, on the moon, the, the Apollo astronauts dropped a hammer and a feather and they hit the moon at the same time because there's no air on the moon to slow it down. So the reason why that the higher mass doesn't being grabbed by the earth doesn't accelerate more is because of inertia and inertia is Galileo's idea. Inertia is the idea that a something that has mass doesn't like to change what it's doing. Okay, it's lazy. So if it's moving, it doesn't want to stop moving. Okay, so if I throw a ping pong ball at you, you can catch it. If I throw a baseball at you, you probably catch it. If I throw a bowling ball at you, you probably should run. It's the idea that the more mass it has, the harder it is to start mo motion because it wants to keep stopped. But once it's moving, the harder it is to stop it. Okay, now we're going to see this idea is embedded in Newton's first law, and that's an object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by another force. And the reason why is because everything that has mass has inertia. And if I'm bigger than you, I have more inertia than you, then it's harder to throw me than it is to throw you. So he built lots and lots of marble ramps. This man built ramps, ramps, ramps. He had so many marble ramps and he loved it. And his study of marbles essentially was a study of gravity. He was studying gravity. Now Newton later, a couple hundred years later, is going to do all the math and write the book. But Galileo thought the thoughts at the first, at least uh, the first one to write about thinking about it. So if you were to drop a marble, it's going to start speeding up. If you make the, the slant of that sl the slope less, it'll still speed up, but it'll, it'll speed up slower. If you make it steeper, it'll speed up faster. So the, the amount of gravity pulling has to do with the, the tilt of the, the ramp. So if you take a, mar a marble and you throw it up a ramp, then it's going to slow down the same amount that it would speed up if you dropped it down the ramp. Okay, so there's something related. The ramps are related to each other. His conclusion was, is if you were to, if it's gonna slow down going up, and speed up going down, then it shouldn't ever move if it goes sideways. So you should be able to roll the ball and for it'll roll forever with no change in speed if there was a frictionless surface. So this idea of friction, something opposing motion, is something we're going to look at.